said, Tucker, what did you learn today? And Tucker said, not enough. He said, I have to come back tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know, you know. And, I, and, and Jessica Templeman, you know, she was with her little kids. She told to the kids, she said, children, today, uh, class, we're only going to have half a school day this morning. And all of her little kids said, hooray. And she said, we're having the other half this afternoon, okay. I don't know, you know. And Preston, I like Preston. You know, on the first day of school, he came home and, and his mother said, you know, Preston, uh, how, how was it? And he said, Mom, I got 100%. And Jennifer said, on what? He said, 40 in math, 60 in English, okay? <laughs> I don't know if that's really true or not, okay? And, and you know, there was, there was Dalton, okay? He came home, and, you know, and, and he was telling me that he was at the, in his chemistry class, and, uh, and, you know, the teacher said, Dalton, uh, what is the chemical formula for water? And he said, H I J. L-M-N-O. And the teacher said, what are you talking about? And Dalton said, well, yesterday you said it was H2O. <laughs> you know, Evan, you got to watch the, the quiet ones, Evan Watchhorn, you know, and, and he had a bad first week, you know, and, uh, and Evan, you know, his teacher said, you know, Evan, I've had to send you to Mr. Lamb's class every day this week. What do you have to say for yourself? And you know what Evan said? Thank God it's Friday. Okay? <laughs> Thank God it's Friday. You know, and little Bo Walsh, you know, you know, they're so cute when they're small, you know, and, and the teacher asked Bo, where are the Great Plains located? And you know what Bo said? At all the great airports. <laughs> you know, and the tailors, who can forget the tailors? Come on, Olivia, you know. The teacher asked, was talking to Olivia, and she said, I, if you had 13 apples, 12 grapes, 3 pineapples, and 3 strawberries, what would you have? And Olivia said, a delicious fruit salad. <laughs> I don't know if that'll work, okay? And, you know, and Evie's not, our, uh, uh, Ellie's not here today, but, you know, she just got her driver's license, and the math teacher asked Ellie, said, a man from Los Angeles drove towards New York at 250 miles an hour. And a man from New York drove towards Los Angeles at 150 miles an hour. Where would they meet? Her mom and dad would be proud. He said, in jail. Okay, in jail. You know, and Bailey, Bailey. I thought of Bailey about this one. You know, the teacher, the, the history teacher asked Bailey, uh, Peyton, he said, can you tell us where the Declaration of Independence was signed? And this is classic Bailey. He said, at the bottom. Uh, and I do believe that, okay? And I haven't forgot about Jordan Peterson. You know, Jordan came home and he said, my teacher says I have to write more clearly. And, and Christine said, well, that's a good idea, Jordan. And Jordan said, no, it's not. Now she'll know I can't spell. <laughs> and my last but not least is Carter. Carter. Carter went to school and uh, he said, teacher, would you punish me for something I didn't do? And the teacher said, of course not. He said, good, because I didn't do my homework. <laughs> you know, those are just little things I thought we'd have fun. Okay, with. Okay, let's go over to the book of James. Let's go to the book of James. I want us to turn over to James chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 16 through 20 today. It says in verse 16, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own free will he brought us forth by his word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. <clears throat> it's interesting, in verse 16, what I found out in the Bible as a pastor and going to Bible school and studying, Usually when God says, don't be deceived, you know why? Because that's where we're deceived at. God, through his Holy Spirit, wouldn't say, don't be deceived, if it wasn't we are quickly and easily deceived in that area. And so he's saying, don't be deceived in verse 16. Don't err, don't wander, don't get off the standard of truth. And, and James, who is the brother of Jesus, is telling us, what should we not, not be deceived about? Number one, that God will tempt you with evil. Don't ever be deceived that God is tempting you with evil. 
Because it tells us that God does not tempt us with evil. I've heard people say, you know, God tempted me. In fact, if you know the Lord's Prayer, it says, lead me not in temptation, but deliver me from evil. And so we need to realize, and we found out earlier in James, what, if we're tempted, we're tempted by our own desires. And so don't ever think God is tempting you with something evil, so don't be deceived of that. And number two, it tells us all good things come from the Father of lights. <clears throat> all good things come from the Father of lights. It says in verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes from the Father of light with whom there is no variation or shadow or turning. The Father of lights, it's amazing. Where do we get that little terminology? It's found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. It says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. See, from this scripture, God is recognized as the creator. How? Because he is the father or the originator of light. So we need to realize, number one, that all of our good gifts come from above, from Father God, and that God doesn't tempt us with evil. Why should we remember that? Because he says, don't be deceived. And so we need to make sure we're not deceived with this. Look what it says in 1 John Chapter uh, 1, verses 5 and five through 7. It says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all then, over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Now, why could you and I be the light of the world? Because our Father is the originator of light. I know kids hate this, but someday, I look at Brody, someday you're probably going to look just like your dad. <laughs> Brody says, oh, no, no, no. Your hair already is getting there, hallelujah, okay? But do you understand, see, we're supposed to look like our dad. And so the Bible tells us that our Father is the Father of light. Then Jesus says in Matthew 5, 14, and you are the light of the world. So you and I should be looking like our Father. And so we need to remember those things, okay? And it says, and every good gift. You know what I found out in life? Everything I have is a gift from God. Everything. You know, there are people that, out, that eat healthy all the time, eat organic, eat no GMOs, all this. And you know what they do? They get cancer and die. And there are other people that maybe eat all the Twinkies they can find, all the sugar they can get, and they live to be 110. Does that make sense? You know why? Because health is not just a product of what we do. You know why? Because, see, if we could just eat right and we would demand that God would make us healthy, then the Bible says we would owe him something. Yet the Scripture says God owes us Nothing. I'm not saying you should be eating Twinkies. Okay, I'm not saying that at all, okay? But I'm telling you, everything we have is a gift from God. You know, when I get up in the morning, it's a gift from God. You know, the other day, and it's so crazy, the other day I read an article about some person that apologized for being born white and privileged. I thought, you know what? You, I don't know what you're apologizing for. And you know what? If, if, you're, if you're so... Uh, so apologetic of, of having privilege, then give some of it to me, hallelujah. I will not apologize for, for being privileged, okay? It is a gift from God. And then the Bible tells us in Timothy that people that have been given more will be held accountable for what God has given them. But everything is a gift. So when you and I get up in the morning and we're healthy, why not say, you know what, thank you, Lord, for this gift today. You know what, when you and I get up and, and we experience something wonderful, tell the Lord, thank you for this gift today. Because it really is a gift from God. See, the Bible tells us we really have nothing good in our life in and of ourselves. And you know what, this is hard for some people to get to. My mother, he came to the Lord late in life, okay? But I remember my mother, she was a school teacher in Iowa, okay, and, and she got an when, when I went to kindergarten, I graduated from kindergarten when my mother graduated from Iowa Central Community 
college. And then for the next year, two years, my mother drove from Fort Dodge to Storm Lake to get her bachelor's degree at Buena Vista. And my mother worked very hard at that. And then my mom was a school teacher for a couple years, and then in the summers, she would drive to Ames, Iowa, and she got her master's degree at Iowa State. And I can remember my mother, before she was a Christian, she said, I did all this myself. She thought she was a self-made woman. She said she did it all herself. Later on in life, she realized, you know who gave her the health to get to those classes? The Lord. You know who gave her the wisdom to do those things? The Lord. My mother realized she was not a self-made person. There's really not such thing as a self-made person. Everything we have is a gift from God. And it's not hard. You know what? See, if you and I think we own things, we're already always trying to hang on to them. But you know what? If we know they're a gift, we know we didn't earn it with our actions, and we can't lose it. It is a gift from God. Look at what it says in Romans 7, 18. In Romans 17, 18, it says, For I know that in me, this is Paul, that in his flesh nothing good dwells, for the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. I think it's amazing in life, the Apostle Paul, who wrote basically two-thirds of the Old Testament, evangelized the known world three times, he could say there was nothing good inside of him except what God had put on side, inside of him. I think if Paul can say that, we can say it. Am I trying to say we're supposed to walk around life saying, I'm just an old worm, I'm no good? No, I'm not saying that at all. Don't beat yourself up. The devil will do that good enough, okay? I'm just saying, though, be thankful for what you have and say, Lord, thank you, this is a gift from God. You know, I remember in life, or, or, I remember in, in my favorite book, in the book of Deuteronomy, You've heard me quote this several times. When the children of Israel are getting ready to come into the promised land, and God told them he was going to give them all these things. And you know, when we have things given to us, we have a propensity to think we earned them. They're ours. And God told Moses to tell the children of Israel, when you live in homes you didn't build, when you drink of wells you didn't dig, when you eat of vineyards you didn't plant, the Lord told Moses to tell the children of Israel, remember, it wasn't the work of your hands, or the sweat of your brow that got them, they were a gift from God. That doesn't mean we don't do anything. It's just saying our actions in and of themselves don't guarantee us anything. I've said many times, there are people that work harder than you and I and have less than what you and I may have. So it's not just our hard work that does it. It's a gift from God. And you know, when we can realize that, you know what it does? It takes a lot of pressure off of us. We can say, you know what, Lord, it's a gift from me. I, I can't earn it, so I'm going to do the very best I can. And then I'm going to move on from there. Amen? It says that there's no variation or shadow or turning. James is letting us know with that little phrase that God doesn't change. I think that's wonderful news in this world, that God doesn't change. I think it's wonderful that we have an unchanging God in an ever-shifting world. I, to, I can trust and depend on the Lord. Tomorrow is the same as yesterday. He doesn't change. There's no movement that way. If God was the father of lights in Genesis, guess what? He's the father of lights in Ponca, Nebraska. How absurd it is to credit or to blame God for any works of darkness in our lives. You've heard people say, I don't know why God did that to those people. If it's not light and it's darkness, God did not do it. You might say, well, how do you know? Because it says he's the author of every good and perfect gift from above. Now, you know what? Bad things happen to good people, and I don't know why. Okay? But I know this. God has made a promise to us that he would take care of us, not only on this earth, but for all of eternity. And we need to realize, we might go through, through some things in this world, and it, maybe it seems like a long time, but I, you know, we sang about today, I'm trading my sorrows for the joy of the Lord. And you know what, folks? There might be some things in this world that seem to get us down, but God says, you know, trade in that sorrow. You're going you're to have some joy. You might suffer a little on this earth, but God says you're going to be able to rejoice for all of eternity. And I promise you, you will never think that you made a bad choice. Amen? God says, I want to bless you with light. It says here in verse 18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creature. You know, at least we, you know, I've always laughed when people get arrogant and proudful that they're Christians. 
The Bible said right there, it's not because we did something. It's God's work on the inside of us. And you know what? What we have in life, physically, <clears throat> emotionally, spiritually, it's a gift from God. He deposited inside of us. Amen? James lets us know it's God's own will, not by our skill or power, that we have become his first fruits. It's interesting that term first fruits, the first century Jewish people would have known this exactly. They knew that first fruits offerings spoke of a greater harvest to follow. It was an offering of dignity and honor. That's why if you read in your Bible, God, when he talks about asking people to bring their offering, he says, the first fruits. Why does God want our first fruits? Number one, it takes faith. But number two, usually the first fruit is the best, okay? And God is saying, and plus, you know what? If we're giving away our first, we're saying, you know what? I know there's more to come. I'm not trying to hang on to it. And so God is saying, you know what? We were his first fruits. Just say in the book of James, that first century, those Christians, knew they weren't the end of the fruit. You and I are still producing fruit. And you know what? If Jesus tarries, there's going to be more Christians that become, that, that make that, more people that make Christ their Lord. And they'll become what? Other fruit after us. So you know what, folks? We're not dwindling. We're growing. Hallelujah. And I think that's really, really important. James is also letting us know that God expects us to become holy and exhibit a holiness in our lives. He wants it. Did I say we're going to be perfect? No. If you and I are looking for perfection, we're going to be disappointed a lot. Turn to your neighbor and say, I believe that. You're going to be disappointed a lot if you're expecting perfection. Over in Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 14, Ezekiel said this, And they shall not sell it, this is talking about the first fruits, nor exchange, nor alienate the first fruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. What's God saying? Your first fruit, we're the, it says Aaron James, that what? We were the first fruits brought forth of his creation. We are holy unto the Lord. You know, there are some different uh, Christian groups, they believe you should worship on Saturday. I'm okay with that in life. You understand? I think you and I should give the first day of our week to the Lord because it is holy. It's amazing in life what we think we can accomplish if we decide not to give God that day. You know that? And you know what? Most of the time we accomplish less. I've always wondered with businesses, especially, Chick-fil-A, <laughs> they make more money on six days than most people open on seven. Hobby Lobby, God has blessed that. I know here in our area, Fairway, they're not open on Sundays. You know, isn't it amazing? These are all retailing organizations, and they're saying, you know what? We're going to give our first fruits to, the, to family, to the Lord, whatever. They're shutting their businesses down. And because they're giving God, I'm guessing, especially Chick-fil-A, giving God that first fruits, it seems like the other six days God is just piling it on them. Isn't it amazing when they said they were going to boycott Chick-fil-A? What happened? They had the biggest week, the biggest month they ever had in their lives. Because that first fruits is holy unto the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 says, But as he who called you is holy, you will also be holy in your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. See, this new birth or first fruits isn't just a reformation of the old, it's a new birth. You're a new creature in Christ. You've been made in the divine image of God. And you know what this new creation involves? A new heart, a new self, a new character, a new life. See, God isn't just redoing the old you. He's made you something brand new. God wants you and I to be holy. I don't know, does that overwhelm anybody besides me? But God says, you know what? It's going to take a lot of work. Now, I don't want you snickering at me because I know it's going to take a lot of work on your side too, Hallelujah. okay? But it's a lot of work. But you know what? If God said we could do it, can we do it? But it's going to take, what? A dedication. That, you know, I don't know about you, but isn't it easy to be unholy? I don't know about you. Just drive in Sioux City. Just go to a Walmart. Okay, you know what I'm saying? You can go to Walmart and lose your salvation. Hallelujah, you know what I'm saying? 
You've heard me talk about that many times in life, okay? You ever gone through the fast lane, 20 items or less, the guy in front of you has 25? Come on, you're thinking, hey, let's count. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. You know, hey, we're past 25 or 20, okay? But you know what God says? You know what? Be holy. Be holy. I don't know about you, but that goes against my old flesh. I don't want to be holy. I want to be unholy, okay? But God says you can be holy. And if God says we can be holy, we can be holy. Not perfect, but holy. And you know what, folks? Because the world is looking at us. They're looking at Christians. You know what's turned many people off? Is Christians. Because they say one thing on Sunday morning and do one thing on Sunday morning, they're doing something else on Saturday night. And God's saying, you know what? That should not be that way. That should not be that way. You're holy. It means that, you know what? We have an image. And I'm not talking about a superficial image. We have an image to uphold. We're supposed to be like Dad. Dad is the Father of lights. And he says, you are the light of the world. See, uh, it says if it involves our heart, our soul, and our strength, okay? It's the Father's life's nature. You know what God wants to do? He wants to bless you. He wants to love you. He wants to bestow gifts upon you for, so you can have a blessed life in this world. The Holy Spirit is the agent in this regeneration, the word of truth is the instrument that he uses. God's spirit and God's word working together. You know, I, I, I tell people this. God's word only, you'll dry up. God's spirit only, you'll blow up. God's word and God's spirit working together, and you know what's going to happen? You're going to grow up. You know, I've heard people say, I'm just a Bible guy only. I don't want any of that Holy Spirit stuff. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I don't want none. Well, you know what? You're just going to dry up. I get these people out of here and say, I'm just a spirit-led person. I don't know about the Bible. You know what you're going to do? You're going to blow up. You know what you need to do? You're going to need to take God's word and God's spirit together. And you know what we do? Then we grow up. And you know what the world's looking for? Grown-up Christians that have a compassion for mankind and a way, the word of God, to help them get out of their situations in life. Amen? See, our safety comes from the fact that God is light. God is unchanging. God is love, and God has provided all that we have need of. It's just the Father of light. Very important. You know, our granddaughter, Charlotte, was here this week for a couple of days. And you know what she wanted? She wanted a nightlight. You know why? Isn't that crazy? That little nightlight gives her peace. You know why? Because there's something peaceful about light. And you know what? If you and I will get next to the Father of Light, you know what's going to happen? It doesn't matter. You know what's amazing? With my little granddaughter, Charlotte, it was dark outside. But in her little room, there was her little nightlight going on so she could have peace. And you know what, folks? There's a dark world outside of us. But you know what? We have the Father of Light on the inside of us. And it might be dark out there, but it's light on the inside. We need that Father of light. In verse 19, it says, So then, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. You know, someone once said, We have two ears and one mouth, showing us we should be more ready to hear than speak. This verse shows us how far we need to travel in our walk with Jesus. Most of the time, we are slow where we should be swift, and we're swift where we should be slow. The Bible says, Be slow to wrath. Who here do you get torqued off pretty quick? I do. You know, you got a short fuse on that firecracker. And God says, you know what? To get anger, we should be slow to anger. Isn't it? Have you noticed a lot of things that come so natural to us, God says we don't have, we shouldn't have in our life. See, we need the power of the Spirit and the truth of His Word to work in on the inside of us to change us. Because it goes down to say in verse 20, for the wrath of God does not produce the righteousness of God. Why doesn't the wrath of God produce God's righteousness? Because the wrath of God is selfish and self-seeking. You know, I had a, a friend of mine in our church back in Indiana, and before he really turned his life over to the Lord, I mean, they're really big into Indiana basketball back there, the Hoosiers and all this. And he said he can remember one time when his son, who's now probably 40 years old, when he was little, he was, his son was, was, was screwing around in front of the television the Hoosiers were watching, over on television, and he couldn't watch the game, so he said, I remember going to grab my kid and throwing him away from the TV. In Jesus' name. 
You know what I'm saying? In Jesus' name. Okay? And he said, it struck me. Why was I angry at my son? It wasn't the wrath of God. It was selfish wrath. You know, and I, my question I'm going to leave you with today is, an easy way to recognize if your wrath is godly or not is ask yourself one simple question. Am I displaying anger because of how it affects me or how it affects the name of Jesus? It's quiet then, okay, you know? So I have to ask myself that question. When I get angry, why am I angry? Because how it affects me or how it affects the name of Jesus. Because I would venture to say, including us all, probably the majority of our wrath is very selfish. Come on. Hey, I'm right there with you, okay? And you know what? And I need to make, see, anger is not necessarily bad. In fact, the book of Ephesians says, be angry and sin not. We found out that Jesus got angry twice, went into church and threw out all the tax uh, table changers and all the, 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 the animals, didn't he? He says he had a whip. He was doing a, a, a crocodile dundee. He was whipping them out of, the, out of the, uh, the temple. Why? He was not angry, but he was selfish because he told them, you have turned my father's house from a house of prayer to a den of thieves. See, Jesus was angry for what they did with God's house. It wasn't about him. It was about what they were doing. And so this week, before you and I fly off the handle, okay, before we get ready to give somebody our two cents worth, and we only got a penny's worth anyway, you know what I'm saying? Let's ask ourselves a simple question. Why? Why am I angry? Is it because how it affects me, I'm being selfish, or how it affects the name of Jesus? Because that's really the real thing. How is this affecting Jesus? How is it affecting Father? You know, we're going to make it, you know that? You know, have you ever sometimes taken two steps forward and one back? That's okay. Well, you know what? My prayer has always been for us as a church, as people, that we'll take at least one step closer to Jesus today than we were now. You know, sometimes we think this journey is too difficult and too long. No, if, if we look at the end, maybe it is. But if we could just take one step closer to Jesus today, we were yesterday. That's all Jesus requires. Let's just get a little, and you know what? If you can't take a full one, can you take a half one? I don't care. As long as we're moving forward just a little bit, I'm thrilled. Jesus is thrilled. I want you to know that. Amen. Well, I'm going to have, as the band is getting ready to go, I have one more, one more story I want to tell you. Talon was a little five-year-old boy whose mom loved him very much. Being a warrior, she was concerned about walking is walking to school when he started in kindergarten. She walked with him for the first few days, but he came home one day telling her he did not want her walking with him to school every day. He wanted to be like the other big boys. He protested loudly, so she had to find another way to handle it. She asked her neighbor Nancy if she would follow her son to school at a distance, but close enough to keep a watch on him. Nancy said that would work out great because her toddler and her had to get out anyway. It would be a good way for them to get some exercise, so she agreed. The next school day, Nancy and her little girl set out behind Callan as he walked to school with his friend Ronnie. They went, this went on for the whole week, and Callan's friend noticed the same lady was following him every day. Finally, Ronnie asked Callan, have you noticed that lady behind us following us all week? Do you know who she is? Callan nonchalantly replied, yes, I know she is. Ronnie asked, who is she? Well, that's Shirley Goodness and her little girl Marcy, Callan said. Ronnie inquired further, what? Why, do, why does she follow you every day like that? Well, Callan said, every night, Mama makes me pray the 23rd Psalm. And in my prayers, uh, because she's worried, and we pray, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. <laughs> so Callan said, I guess I just have to get used to them. <laughs> so goodness and mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life. I want you to know. Why don't we stand up as we... Thank you.